molyb- molybdenum. Molybdenum and terillium. Like, terillium. Sounds like a Star Wars element. It's, all the elements sound like Star Wars elements. Yeah, molybdenum, chromium, chromium. More of like a Transformers element. That is more of a Transformers element. Chromium Prime. Okay. Are we recording? Yes. Well, howdy, everybody. Welcome back to the Dirt Talk Podcast Monday episode edition. Very happy to be here. And today, this episode is going to be featuring a project. Once a month, I will review a very cool project that I've been to. And not only will I provide some of my personal experiences regarding the project as I have done in the past, but I have also come bearing some research. I am holding some papers in my hand with some numbers and information to share with you all. So it's not just me blabbing in an unstructured manner from memory. It's actually me talking about a project or mindset with helpful information alongside it this is groundbreaking this is this, 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 is, this is this is totally new yeah. for dirt talk this is it's very new yeah <laughs> I, I like i just told you before we started recording this i spent a lot of time on this actually probably too much time um but yeah today without further ado we're going to talk about Ken, uh, kennecott utah copper which is also known as the bingham canyon mine It is an absolutely amazing place uh, in Utah producing copper. Um, I will also just before I start this say that all of this information is subject to be completely wrong. So don't take this as 100% factual. If you do, shame on you. You should know better by now if you've listened to any other episode. But I did my best. I researched this heavily from all different sources. I'm not going to present my sources. But I did uh, research this heavily and uh, am very excited to present this all. So the Bingham Canyon mine, owned and operated by mining giant Rio Tinto, is also known as Kennecott. So you might hear as Bingham Canyon, as as Kennecott, as Rio Tinto in Utah. There's all sorts of different nicknames for this place, but it is one of the world's largest copper mines. And funny enough, it's only a few miles from downtown Salt Lake City, and yet no one really in Salt Lake City knows that it exists, let alone services of a vast swath of their life. Shocking. Yeah. Um, Many claim it's the largest man-made excavation on Earth. I don't know who verifies the largest excavation on Earth, whether that's Guinness World Records or the large hole foundation. That might be something else. Uh, But a lot of people say it's the largest man-made excavation. It is uh, 27,000 acres of land. The main pit is over half a mile deep and 2.5 miles wide. And there have been 120 years of official mining at the site, which is pretty spectacular. Um, It produces mainly copper, but other products are gold, silver, molybdenum, and terillium, which I have a a problem saying. Um, molly, Molly or molybdenum, Uh, is used for lubricants, and it's also used to strengthen steel. It's a very important uh, compound in in different steel alloys. And then terillium is used in solar panels. So in 2020, Bingham Canyon produced uh, 140,000 tons of copper, which is 310 million pounds. That's a lot of copper. 170,000 troy ounces of gold which is substantially more than Gold Rush produced, uh, 2.2 million troy ounces of silver, and uh, 20,400 tons of molybdenum. You said troy ounces? Troy ounces. What is troy? What is I, don't know unit? Who, I don't know who troy is. I'm mm-hmm. assuming it's probably close to an ounce. Okay. If not an ounce. Yeah. Um, but that's no joke. That's in one year. That's in 2020. So they're not just producing copper. I mean, 170,000 ounces of gold almost as a byproduct is pretty insane. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, my l- oh, sorry. Go on. Well, well, how much do you think that would be in like 
Um, in I, I, dollar signs. I think it's over $2,000 an ounce right now is where gold is at. So a lot. A lot. I'm not going to do that. Much. Well, it's if you, uh, I think 340 million, assuming a troy ounce is $2,000. So three hundred forty million dollars, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, I'll say. Um, mine life is estimated now to be around twenty forty, with the current expansions above and now they're underground. And I think beyond just the sheer size of this place, uh, the most fascinating thing about it is that it's the only integrated copper mining operation in North America, and one of only few in the world. And what this means is they start with raw ore. And just a few miles away in the same chain, value chain, or however you say it, they end with 99.9% pure copper. Which is crazy. In the same place, which is especially crazy to, for that to happen in North America. Yeah. Since smelters are not exactly uh, welcome in North America. They're essential, but not exactly welcome anymore, which is a shame. So... uh Pretty spectacular. Pretty spectacular. This place is no joke. It's the real deal. Um, so when it comes to importance, that's a little bit of background on the mine. When it comes to the importance of this place, what's the big deal? Why should you care about it? Well, if you use electricity, you use copper, which is the product of this mine. And I think every human being uses electricity in some form nowadays. And 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 if you didn't have power. You couldn't do a single thing. You, you, you take it for granted until it goes away, but you see power go out for even a few hours and you right before your eyes, just watch human beings lose all sense of composure, uh, just with a few hours of darkness. It's, it's crazy. Happened crazy. In, happened in Texas. It, boy, did it. Most, most recently. Um, copper consumption per capita in America is 13 pounds per person. Every single year. That's a ton. Yeah. Well, it's not a ton. It's 13 pounds. It's 13. Uh, but there's an average of 400 pounds of copper in an American household, which is pretty insane. Half as a ton. Well. That's close. Uh, no, no, no. Quarter ton. Yeah. 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 Almost a quarter ton. Uh, I guess one fifth of a ton, 20%. Um, and then McKinsey estimates global copper demand will be 37 million tons by 2031, up from the current 25 million tons produced today. Uh, so we're going to have to substantially wrap up copper production by 2031, which is not very far away to meet the global demand. Uh, America is the world's fifth largest copper producer, and Kennecott is the second biggest copper uh, producer in America. Hmm. Second biggest copper mine. Second Whoa. to- So there's a bigger one. Uh, yeah, second to Marenzi in uh, Arizona. Ah, uh, okay. Arizona produces a majority of America's copper. Yeah. Yeah. That's why copper is one of the five C's of Arizona. I learned that in grade school. I didn't even, I don't know what that is. Uh, five C's of Arizona. Copper, cattle, citrus, hmm. cotton, and commerce. Uh, no. Co copper, cattle. You better brush up on no, this. We're going no. to trivia later. <laughs> I think it's copper, cattle, citrus, climate. Oh. And commerce. Climate. Or maybe cotton's in there. I don't know. But five C's. Copper's one of them. Today sure. we learned how to count underdog. <laughs> Um, so the history of this place is, is pretty fascinating being well over a hundred years old. Um, back in the mid 1800s, the copper deposits were originally discovered in the mountains west of Salt Lake City Valley by settlers grazing cattle. So, uh, Salt Lake City, for those of you unfamiliar with it, it runs north to south. It's this yeah. amazing valley and there's mountains on both sides of it. The mountains, if you're facing north to the east, uh, is the is called the Wasatch Front, and that's where Park City and and all the all the ski resorts are. And then if you look west to the other side, that range is where uh, Kennecott is housed. And if you fly into Salt Lake City uh, into the airport, oftentimes you fly right over the pit, which is 
absolutely spectacular to see, especially this time of year when there's snow up on the mountains. So you said it was um, two miles long? A mile uh, deep? 2.5 miles wide, over half a mile deep. Yeah, but you can't really see it from town, which is the most fascinating. That's why most people don't even know it's there. You can see some of the t- tailings, but even the, the tailings is very well managed. And so mm-hmm. w- to the untrained eye, you can't tell it's there. Yeah. Um, so they found this place mid 1800s grazing cattle. Uh, in the late 1800s, they started mining uh, officially, but it was smaller in scale to start. There was nothing uh, all that dramatic about it. And then open pit mining at what became eventually the Bingham Canyon Mine commenced with the official formation of the Utah Copper Company in 1903. So 2023 was their 120th anniversary officially. By 1912, the mining operation became the, became the largest in the world thanks to gains in efficiency and uh, rail operations that they had they installed there. And then during World War II, while many other mines shut down to conserve resources and labor, Kennecott produced up to 30% of the copper used by the Allied forces. Isn't that wild? Yeah, and they need a lot of copper. Well, I was uh, I was on the iron ore range the other day up in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, and those yeah. iron ore mines up there are really historic because that's where most of the iron ore was mined to provide for um, Carnegie Steel Company, mm-hmm. uh, U.S. Steel down yeah. in um, Pittsburgh, and then the 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 the, the plants along. Uh, what's the lake by Chicago? Superior? Huron mm. or Superior? It's oh. one of those ones. I feel like it's Superior. I think it. Wait, you said by Chicago? Yes. Yeah. There are steel mills around there. Anyway, I think it. We, I, we could very well both be wrong. Well, Dan and I were at a foundry, and we were talking about how important this iron ore range is that yeah. most people again don't know it exists. Uh, and what they said was, yeah, basically this iron ore helped win World War II. And you think about that, yeah. and you're like, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Like this is where the steel came from for the battleships, for the the rifles, for all of what the Allied forces were using. And our stuff was expensive too. That's crazy. Our stuff was real expensive. Um in the mid nineteen hundreds, the mine became so big that it swallowed the city of Bingham Canyon. So they resettled a city. Uh, so that the mine could continue expanding. And then in the late 1900s, a string of acquisitions of the mine led to some production interruptions. Uh, Kennecott was sold, uh, it's funny enough, to Standard Oil of Ohio in 1981, which then became British Petroleum in 1987. And then in 1989, Rio Tinto bought the entire operation, officially becoming the Kennecott Utah Copper Cor- Corporation as it exists today. So Rio Tinto has operated it since 1989, over 30 years, if my math does me correct. Math. So this has been a long standing pit. Been yeah. 120 years, 100. And- yeah, over 120 technically. I mean, no, you don't yeah. dig a hole that big overnight. That's so crazy. Yeah. Uh, so present day, present day is where we get into the fun stuff. <clears throat> I, uh, for today, am going to focus on the surface mining operation because that is what I've seen. That is what I'm most familiar with. Uh, at a later date, maybe we can revisit the underground operation because we're working on a video right now featuring this entire operation, which I'm really excited about. Uh, assuming Rio Tinto likes it and has us back, we'll then go to the underground portion. And I can address that more in detail once I learn about it. But as of right now, I just know it exists. I know nothing about it. Um, The mine, since it's copper, is a hard rock operation, which means everything really starts with after exploration, after they know where the ore body is Mm -hmm. with drilling and blasting. So they use enormous Epiroc, P&H, and Caterpillar drills for all the all the holes they're drilling essentially nonstop blasting every day sometimes multiple times daily to produce the material necessary uh, for blasting they use variable density emulsion which is really really incredible stuff um, as the drills penetrate the rock they uh, essentially map its hardness and then the blasters can use this information to judge how to load each hole to get perfect fragmentation. And the, 
the way the variable density emulsion works is uh, you can essentially put more air into it to fluff it up. So the more air you put into it, the less dense it is. So the less energy there is. And so the harder rock you put less air into, you want higher density, higher energy. And then if it's softer rock, quote unquote, you'll fluff it up a bit. And the goal is for the rock, reg regardless of hardness, to fragment evenly so that yeah. the shovels can dig it very nicely. Whoa. Yeah. Pretty fancy stuff. That is fancy. Um, after they blast, they rely, their production diggers, as the Australians would say, are P&H 4100 rope shovels. Um, basically the biggest rope shovels in the world. Some work in the pit, which is within the ore. And then others that we saw are up top working on the extension, which is still mostly overburden. Okay. And the way copper works is it's in it's within rock and it's within an ore body. And so they'll poke a bunch of holes. It's called exploration. They'll pull up the, the rock um, from sometimes thousands of feet down. They'll sample it all. And then from those samples, they'll be able to map what is the ore body. Uh, okay. And then depending on the price of copper and gold and silver and everything they're after de uh, determines the the economics behind what they do and don't go after. Yeah, because they have to account for all their fuel burn and people. Yeah, and, and so, so they'll, so for waste, it has nothing of value in it. They will just strip it and haul it to uh, a, a dump area. For low grade, they might still um, take it and stockpile it somewhere for a later date when metal prices are in theory higher. Yeah, And then the good stuff that's lower into the pit, that's what goes to the crusher and, and eventually goes through the entire process. And then do we know where it goes from there? Oh. Uh, we'll get into that. Boy, do we. Yeah. Boy, do we. Um, there are also smaller, quote unquote, machines like 500 ton Hitachi excavators <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think a Cat 6060 shovel and a 994K Caterpillar loader. Cool. But those are really cleanup, quote unquote, cleanup machines. Yeah. They're not the production machines, which is kind of funny. I want to see just like one mini excavator out there. <laughs> uh, they do. They have little machines for small stuff, but yeah, like a, yeah. a, a a small machine out there is a 390. They'll have a 390 yeah. to work on ditches or something like that, yeah. which is the biggest excavator you'd see in a city. That's crazy. Unless you live in Nashville. With I'm actually Jones Brothers running. Looking at a 390. Yeah, there's a 390 running the desk. Um, so that's loading for hauling. They run a mixed truck fleet of 320 ton trucks. They're Komatsu 930s and. Caterpillar 794 electric drive ACs. Uh, they all haul the ore from down in the pit and uh, haul it up to multiple crushers that range that are about 8,000 tons per hour, which is pretty 8, serious. 8,000 tons per hour. That's, that's insane. A, that's significant tonnage. I had to just like say that because <laughs> yeah. I had to like visualize that. For yeah. A yeah. And they're, they're running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 <sighs> days a year. What are the shift times like for those trucks? Like 12 on? I think it's 12 hours. Yeah. I think it's 12 hours there. I'm not totally sure though, but it's a really nice schedule. Like working at this mine, this is one of the nicest mines in the world to work for. Because they have an amazing schedule that they run. You don't work. You don't work Monday through Friday in mining. You work a few days at a time. So you technically have a ton of time off. It's, yeah. a, it's a really good gig. And then the, what, what also makes this mine so good to work for is it's right next to the city. So you can live a totally normal life in the city. Like it's like a 20 minute drive to work, 30 minute drive to work to one of the largest mines in the world. Yeah. Whereas typical, if you're, if you're at the Pilbara in uh, Australia, you're flying in, flying out every day. So you're out there for a week or two at a time. Then you have to get on multiple planes, most likely fly home. It's a whole process just to get out there. Whereas this, you just drive to work like a, any, any other person. Yeah. Um, so processing. It goes through primary crushing, and then the ore heads to the concentrator by conveyor. 
So at this point, it's significantly less than 1% copper. So if you take uh, uh, any volume of this stuff, uh, less than 1% of that volume will be the good stuff they're after. And then here's uh, where it starts to get a little complex. And I'm going to keep it very simple because I'm a simple man and I don't understand how this process really works. But at its core, the, the concentrator takes the ore and removes most of the rock from it. So they crush everything to a fine powder in ball mills. And, and the way ball mills work is they feed uh, the, the crushed rock, which is I think like six inch minus, eight inch minus, somewhere in that ballpark. So anything less than six inches, eight inches. They feed it into these ball mills and the ball mills are just giant drums, washing machines with uh, steel balls inside of them. And the steel balls sit there and essentially just pulverize the material to a dust, That's a very, wild. very fine dust. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's being, being in that room with all the ball mills and rod mills is, is wild. Probably so loud. It is very loud. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, have to wear, you have to wear your protection for sure. Uh, and then they combine it with water and chemicals. The chemicals are key because they they bond to the copper and the good stuff, and it floats uh, uh, to the top of the concoction. So they introduce some air, and there's this froth that floats to the top, and they skim that off, forming the real nice good stuff. Um, the result here is is two products. Like I said, copper concentrate within a slurry that's pumped to the refinery, which I'll talk about in a second, and uh, molybdenum as a powder ready for shipping. So they're able within the concentrator to separate the molybdenum, press it to dry it, and then put it in these giant white sacks that they, that they ship out from there. Um, what's left, <clears throat> so this, the, the copper concentrate goes to the smelter. What's left is uh, the waste, which is called tailings in, yep. in, in water. And so they will uh, discharge the tailings into these settling ponds and allow uh, some of the, the, the tailings to settle out and, and thicken a little bit. And then they pump the thick tailings to a tailings pond uh, where it, it builds up over time. It kind of just fans out over this enormous plain. Think of a I don't know, a giant, a giant bathtub, giant bowl. And they just pump this material in there, like silty material. You pump it in there. The, the dirt will settle onto the ground and then you can skim the water off and recycle it through the system. So you're not really using more water. You're recycling the water. And then as it builds up, you build uh, up the walls, the tailings dam, what it's called, you build up the walls of the bathtub to accommodate more and more and more and more tailings. But it'll just keep compacting because it's like- well, it, it it you don't need to compact it, yeah, because it just settles out. Yeah, and and you 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 engineer your tailings dams to retain this information or to to retain this this um the tailings. Which, and, and then, date. which eventually dries out once you're done. Potentially hazardous material. I mean, uh, no, it's not hazardous. It's just uh, hard to manage. Yeah, it, yeah, and and if it gets out, it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, but then once they're done with it, they reclaim it, so they they'll cover everything with topsoil. They'll plant it, so it just looks like eventually like a grassy hill when they're done with it, yeah. and no one would know otherwise. Do they have like specialized machines for tailings? Uh, sometimes up in like the oil sands, for example, they run these LGP D eights with the radiators mounted on the roof because they bury them so much in the sand. Uh, tailings is pretty gnarly just from like a, because you can sink in it very easily. Yeah. It's very difficult. It's yeah. Like quick sand mud. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so now the copper concentrate is roughly 25% copper at this point. And dry, it's like heavier brown dirt. You still can't really tell it's copper. Uh, to the untrained eye, it just looks like dirt. Uh, but the smelter, which is the next step, is where it starts to get pretty close to that, that good stuff, that copper. Um, they dry the concentrate. And then through the smelting process, using heat from natural gas, they convert it to liquid. The good stuff the copper, the gold, the silver is more dense 
So it stays at the bottom while the bad stuff, the bad quote unquote stuff, which is mostly iron and sulfur ends up on the top. And then this is essentially where they lose me. Uh, we mm-hmm. were in the, we went to the smelter and we had to do all this training and we have these full face respirators on and we have all kinds of, it's the most protective equipment I've ever worn in my life. It's, it is crazy how much stuff we had to put on um which is which is fine like i i totally get it but uh yeah it was a lot of training we 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 get all set up we go in there uh but the problem was it was so loud and we were using these full face respirators so we couldn't hear anything i i he was our guide was talking to us the whole time but i had not a single clue what was being said. And he was pointing and nodding. And I was like nodding like, yeah, I, I know what's going on. I had no idea what was going on, but it's like I said, you're taking this, um, 25% metal, you're melting it all down. And through a series of processes, you're separating the good stuff. That's all liquid from the bad stuff. And the bad stuff, quote unquote, is the iron, which is slag. Uh, and then the good stuff basically ends up getting poured into these, in, these giant chunks of copper called anodes, which are at this point about 98% copper with gold, silver, and other metals mixed into it. A yeah, nice little fun grab bag. It's, it's huge. They're, I think they're like 750 pounds each. So they're just these giant plates with yeah. these two little ears on the top of them. And they pour, they pour the liquid. We saw where they were pouring these anodes, which was pretty cool. Seeing liquid metal, liquid metal or lava, anything of the sort. I don't, have you seen anything like lava or liquid metal? Not, um, no, not in person, I don't think. Well, maybe maybe you've seen like a like a branding iron get red hot. I've seen yeah, or metal, I've seen, I've metal seen, get hot. Actually, no, I probably have because I've seen like acetylene torches. And yeah, we, but we, we've burned some things with. I guess it's <laughs> it's similar. Uh, you for whatever reason you just want to grab it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like mesmer- mesmer- yeah. yeah, yeah. You're just drawn to it like a moth to a flame. You're like, oh, that's so cool. So seeing liquid metal is one of my favorite things to see in the world. It is so, so cool. Fun fact. So cool. They have a, um, they have like a day at um, Mass Art in Boston where they do like a whole like forage show and it's like all pouring liquid metal. And stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's crazy. Nice. It's like an art installation thing that they do every I year. I, I guess like glass blowing too. Yeah. Glass so, blowing is yeah. awesome too. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're we're at the point we have ninety eight percent copper in these giant chunks of metal called anodes, but we need it to be ninety nine percent ninety nine point nine percent copper, and we need to get the other stuff out. Mm-hmm. And this is where the refinery comes into play. And I I was I was amazed that Rio Tinto was so open to having us involved in this process. I just wanted to see the big diggers, the big shovels. Yeah. But they were like, do you want to come to the smelter and refinery too? And I was like, boy, do I. Um, so I'm I'm just over the moon that we we got to see this. But we walk into this, um, essentially what's this giant, giant warehouse. And this giant warehouse has all of these baths. So you're, you're walking, they kind of come up like a few feet, but they go far below the, the, the floor that you're walking around on. And all of these tubs have uh, have 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 a warm electrolyte solution in them. It was like blue Gatorade, essentially, is what it looked like. And they lower these blanks or uh, lower the the anodes into this bath in rows. So they lower these in with a crane. They grab them, lower them in. Uh, they use like a rail system to to carry these from the smelter over to the refinery. They wheel them in, they have this crane, they lower them into the bath. And then in between each, each of the anodes is a, a stainless steel blank is what they call it. So they put these stainless steel blanks in between each anode and then they run an electrical current through it all. And over the course of a few weeks, the copper, again, this is where it goes way over my head, but the copper gets 
very excited. It's like, ooh, this is nice. This, feel, ooh, this is like nice, nice warm bath. And ooh, there's some electricity in the water. Like, ooh, this is, yeah, a little I'm getting, heating. I'm getting a little loose here. Yeah. And it goes from the anode to the steel blank. And I think it's a two week process for this entire thing to happen. And so the anode essentially dissolves. The blanks get covered on both sides by pure copper. And then all the other stuff, because it's more dense, falls to the bottom of the tank. The gold, the silver, the really, really valuable stuff. Um, and then they pull out these blanks with the crane. They put them onto this little automated cart, which then takes them to the final part of the process where these blanks, they, they rotate in circles. All this, all this is automated. It's really cool to see. And then there's this like this scraper that scrapes the copper off the stainless steel blanks. The stainless steel blanks are reused. So they go right back into the baths and you essentially have these giant sheets of 99.9% pure copper that are then all stacked on top of each other, bundled up. And then there's rail cars that come into this warehouse area. They take forklifts and put the copper right onto the rail cars for distribution around North America. And then the sludge which is what they call the stuff that falls to the bottom. <laughs> they further refine that at the refinery to turn it into pure gold, uh, pure silver, and the terillium uh, yeah. for, for solar panels. I'm assuming it's like a similar electroplating process. Mm, or no? I just... don't think it is. Yeah, I don't think it is. I would love to see what that looks like, like the sludge after. Yeah, we... Curiously, they wouldn't let us around the sludge, the very expensive right. sludge. Uh, <laughs> Damn it. And... Uh, uh, we asked if there was a gold pour going on that day, a silver pour, but there was not. Okay. They only do it a few times a week. Probably because they don't get as much. They don't get as much. Yeah. 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 But but we were there. We weren't there for the gold and silver. We were there for the copper and we got to see it. And then they made me a little bundle. I have it on my desk now of small pure copper plates. It was with, probably worth something. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm going to have this thing forever. It looks so cool. It's just yeah. this pure copper block, essentially. With this little strap to to mimic how they ship the copper out of <laughs> the of the refinery. That's funny. So that <clears throat> is how they get to pure copper, which then goes on to get used for all sorts of different things, like the Statue of Liberty. Like I thought that was a gift, Grant. <laughs> but they had to get the copper from somewhere. Uh, pure um, or, uh, anything electrical. Uh, cars, phones, anything of the sort. These microphones. These microphones. Yeah, copper, you, copper coil in here. Without copper, you would not be able to listen to this podcast. Copper and magnets. That's all they are. That's it. Uh, so that that's the Kennecott, Utah copper process. You're you you mine the rock, you crush the rock, and then you pull the good stuff out of the rock. There you go, pure copper. That's wild. So I was curious, like. With the copper sheets on the stainless, is it literally just like a knife that like kind of scrapes it off? Yeah. I thought it would be like a milling head or something. No, they just, just, they just scrape it off. It's just like, it's um, soft enough. So it's yeah. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much softer than the, um, than the stainless steel is. That's so crazy. And then they reuse the stainless steel. Uh, Forever. Yeah. And you can't even tell copper was stuck to it. It's so. That's so. Yeah. And it's so. What boggled my mind was that it's so, you, you go to the smelter and you're like, this is a very complicated place because there's just pipes everywhere. And you're sitting there the entire time. What I'm wondering is like, how do they know, how do they know that all these pipes are in the right place? How do you, how do you figure this, this whole place out? Who designs this? Who, yeah. who makes this up? I have yeah. no idea. Uh, so it, it looks very complicated, but it's very simple. It's, let's just grab the rock let's smash it a bunch and then let's melt it all down and then use some electricity to make this pure copper like and and also i was figuring out who 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 figures all this out who was the first to do who was the first to figure this one someone out, please write us and tell us like who was like, the person that made this process because yeah looking at this rock like you know what you know what I, I think I can get the copper out of that rock. Like one, I think there's copper in that rock. Two, I think I know how to get it out. I was 
I mean, I'm sure it's because there was a demand for more pure copper. Well, yeah. I mean, electricity comes around. Yeah. Yeah, you got to you got to start producing it and they've been doing it like this for a long time. I do I do also want to mention the smelter is a really big deal. Rio Tinto has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in the smelter to be up to the most stringent environmental standards. It's one of the finest smelters in the world. And it's really important that we smelt in the United States because it reduces our dependency on foreign metals. Uh, Most other mines in the United States, they produce the copper concentrate themselves, and then they will uh, take the copper concentrate and ship it abroad, primarily to Asia, where it is smelted in Asia without those stringent environmental standards. Let's just sweep it under the rug, even though it's the same atmosphere here that it is there. And then they ship it back as pure copper. Yeah, That is crazy to me because we're producing it here in North America, inside of the United States of America, something that people can't live without. This is mission critical stuff. Yeah, And we're depending upon a foreign supply chain to give it, to a, give it back to us consistently. Yeah. Which is, which is to me, a little frightening. But um, thanks to Rio Tinto, uh, they're able to produce a, a, a large portion of our copper uh, domestically, which I think is very cool. Which I'm sure a lot of that does go to the military, or some of it might go to the military. They, some of it might, but they said, mm, I don't think most of it does. I don't think most of it does. I think most of it is still for um, primarily buildings. Oh, for built for like wiring. Yeah, yeah. So, I think that's the biggest uh, biggest use of copper still today. But I mean, it would make sense that some of it does because like and pennies. It would be pretty hypocritical to, I don't know. It would be to make like planes out of foreign copper. No, that, that's what the military does all the time. That's uh, almost almost all of our metals nowadays is are yeah, is all foreign. That's yeah. that's why that's why it's it's a it's a a national security thing is yeah, hey, no, it, like it, our supply chains. I mean, that's why there's a huge push for semiconductors right now in the United States. The Ch- the Chips Act. Hey, we need to build semiconductors in the states because a majority of our semiconductors are coming from Taiwan right now. And we saw in COVID, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe, what you don't believe, whatever you think is going to happen. We saw during COVID. Uh, global supply chains get interrupted. Bad things start to happen, and and stuff starts to unravel. And Look no further than what's happening right now in the Red Sea. You have uh, these these rebel factions out of Yemen attacking ships at random, mm-hmm. going through the Red Sea, which is a huge percentage of global shipping traffic. It's already costed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in yeah. this in this disruption right now, because now these ships can't and won't go through the Red Sea, which is then ends up in the Suez Canal, yep. which then goes to the Mediterranean and up into Europe. They have to go all the way around Cape Horn, all yep. the way around Africa, which is another like 30, 40, 50 days uh, delaying all of these very critical shipments. So the more we can produce here, the better. Is I did see a kind of stupid thing about that. I was like, um, reject modern modern modernity modern uh modernity uh, yeah yeah yes and then there was like embrace tradition and it showed all the shipping routes going around cape horn cape horn yeah. <laughs> yeah. well that's what we're doing it's crazy like it is literally bringing people like it's setting people back like hundreds of years yeah well and costing and costing literally tons of money hundreds of billions of dollars yeah. and mostly impacting europe right now um Okay, uh, before we wrap up, there's a few other things I want to cover about Kennecott. Uh, first, is people familiar with um, Kennecott probably are familiar with the infamous slide that occurred. Hmm. And so in 2013, early 2013, Rio Tinto detected the earth beginning to move along a large section of of the mine and they run these mines they run all of this detection equipment to detect any kind of movement in the earth mm-hmm. so that they can get ahead of any kind of failure in the high wall yeah. and when you're you're dealing with this you're taking essentially the pressure off the earth by digging this hole and you think you just assume the earth is going to stay where it is but that's not always the case so they run all of this very sophisticated detection equipment they detected the earth starting to move 
And so they evacuated the mine and they essentially just waited because there's nothing you can do. Um, the earth ultimately gave way, uh, ultimately shifting an estimated 165 million tons of material to the bottom of the pit, which is just absolutely mind boggling. Um, it took years to clean this up. Obviously, it was a major disruption to production. But they didn't just call it a day. They cleaned it up. And uh, nowadays, you can't even tell. You have to know what you're looking for to even yeah. notice where it happened. Yeah. Um, I, I, like, I really had to look for it. Untrained eye. It's hard to tell where it happened because they've done such a nice job cleaning it all up again. Um, and uh, Kennecott and mines around the world now use this as a case study in safety and monitoring. So uh, they learned a lot from this. And while it was far from ideal, I do not believe anybody was hurt because they were able to evacuate. They caught it on time and then they were able to clean it up and they're producing without issues today. Pretty, pretty astounding, like that they... I mean, I'm sure they lost some equipment. They did lose. There's some famous Um, pictures of some machines partially buried at the bottom of the pit. Massive machines just like buried. Yeah. Well, they they, they thought it was going to go, you know, X distance, but it went Y distance and Y distance is where a shovel was. Um, But it's just, but I mean, that's the game. No people. And yeah, I mean, it's a modern Marvel. Like it's, so it's, you know, things always they plan for these things like <laughs> well and that yeah and, and when you're when you're doing things that have never been done with the earth before no y- you're going to encounter unknowns you're going to encounter uh, the earth's going to push back at some point uh and you can only do so much so i just wanted to cover that i i thought it was um very relevant if you, you look up pictures of it it's 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 absolutely insane and the craziest thing like like i said you look at a picture of that and you're just like, all right, they must have just packed up and gone home because there's no, there's, what do you do? And nowadays, again, you can't, you can't even tell it happened. And yeah. so to clean up 165 million tons of material is, is no joke. Um, and finally, you know, you might be wondering, man, this would be really cool to see for myself. And I think future projects I'll talk about and operations I'll talk about you cannot see for yourself, which is why I'm talking about them and sharing about them. However, um, you can see this mine for yourself, uh, amazingly enough, at their visitor center, which is typically open between April and October every year. Uh, It's weather dependent, so it's not open right now in January when we're recording this. However, uh, it's open all summer, so you can schedule uh, and buy tickets online if you Google the Rio Tinto Visitor Center. Um, or Kennecott Visitor Center, and then you just drive up there and there's this there's this overlook. So you can actually see the entire pit from the visitor center and they have a big truck tire and all kinds of amazing stuff up there. And so if you're if you're a mining fan, man, I I highly recommend going to see this place because just looking out over the pit is well worth well worth the trip if you're in if you're in the Salt Lake area. Um so thank you again to Rio Tinto for having us. They were remarkably accommodating and were so helpful getting us into the mine all kinds of amazing access when it when it came to the mine whatever we wanted to see uh within reason uh we got to go through the concentrator the smelter the refinery they took a lot of time with us two days to tour us around this whole place and i i'm just so happy we had the experience so i'm very very grateful and wanted to shout them out once again yeah, that was very cool of them. Yeah. Well, I had fun listening to this. Was that good? Yeah, I, I had a blast. You know, because I, I could have just, from memory, walked through, but I feel yeah. like I don't know if it's worth listening to when I do that because it's not as organized. Whereas yeah. this, like, I feel like I can do that, but then back it up with some information, like 27,000 acres. And like, then back it up with some footage because there will be some footage coming out. There will be a YouTube video too. So. Um, so if you see one of, uh, you know, anything that I feature on social media, I'm down to dig into no pun intended. So if you all see some pictures or some videos about a specific operation or machine, anything I've seen, 
write us at dirttalkatbillwith.com. Uh, say, hey, could you make a podcast episode talking about this? And I'll say, maybe. And I'll think about it. And if it's worth talking about, I will. Um, we appreciate everybody listening this year. Uh, like I said, I'm just so excited to be doing some new stuff, trying some stuff out with the Monday episode. I hope you're all enjoying it. And we'll see you on the next one. In the meantime, stay dirty, everybody.